Welcome to the Statistic in ED YouTube channel. Today I want to show you how we can improve on visualizations for a very simple data set. We'll start with pie charts. Pie charts have a bad reputation in the data visualization community. We'll see why. We'll move on to bar charts and finally end off with an animation and we'll see that we need very little extra effort to change a static bar chart into an animation. I have to admit that for me it takes some effort to get into this mindset of gradually improving plots and seeing them from the point of view of the reader who doesn't know the data as well as I might know it. Um, I used to think that um, I have the data, I just choose a plot type, I display the data and I'm done. <laughs> but of course that is not the case and it's often worth putting in more effort um, to gradually improve plots. So that's what we want to do today. The data that we're using today um, refers to polls and we have five candidates and just the shares that each candidate has in each poll. And we start with a simple pie chart. The code is always on the left. So we see I use theme void because in a pie chart I don't want to use coordinate systems. I don't want to display them. And we see that the function to create the pie chart in ggplot2 is the geomcall function. So there's no geompy function in ggplot2, but we have to use geomcall that we also use for the bars and then display it on a polar coordinate system. I somewhere heard that when something is hard to do in ggplot2, it may be that it's not a good idea. So it doesn't seem like Hadley wants to encourage us to um, use pie charts in ggplot2. Okay, on to the next chart. Let's see, we want to compare three polls for three different months. We're using the same pie chart as before, but now we add one line to display the three points in time um, as facets using the facet wrap function. And we, here we have the modern approach with the vars function to specify the variable. We'll see an alternative in a moment. And note also the highlight, highlighted code at the top um, I'm using the factor in order function from the four cats package to change the factor levels of the polls. If I hadn't used that line, then the three months would be displayed in alphabetical order with August coming first, which is not what we want here. So the data is already sorted as we want to show it. So I can use the factor in order function. Now, if the question was how the shares of the three candidates changed over time, I'm pretty confident that I'm not the only one who would struggle to read that chart. We may just see that there are some subtle changes between the candidates, between the shares that the candidates reached, but it's very hard to quantify them with this type of chart. So pie charts are really not suited for this type of comparison. The human eye is very bad at interpreting angles um, and quantifying them. So before we move on to bar charts, I want to show you one last thing about pie charts. Hadley's favorite pie chart is here, a Pac-Man display. <laughs> Most of the chart resembles Pac-Man and part of it does not resemble Pac-Man. If you want the code for this, um, it's even included in the ggplot2 package in the help page for the chord polar function. By the way, the code for the whole presentation and also, also the data is on my GitHub profile. The data is created in line in the markdown document. Um, the link is in the description. My favorite pie chart is one that I found on the data pine blog that I can recommend. So it shows a pyramid in the blue sky and you see we can distinguish the sunny side and the shady side of the pyramid. But that's enough on pie charts for now. Let's move on to bar charts. This is our first go with a simple bar chart. And now we see that we can compare the shares of the three candidates and as they change over time much more clearly than we could in the pie charts we see that the order of the candidates was exactly reversed from July to September and the state of affairs in August was somewhere in the middle between these two months of July and September. Um, so yeah, we can quantify the changes much better now. You see on the left that I switched to the theme BW because now I want to display coordinates, coordinate systems, X and Y axis information. We're still using the same geom call function as before, but not on a polar coordinate system anymore. And here you see for the facet wrap function, I use the older but still valid um, formula interface 
using the tilde that you may know from regression formulas, for example. Now let's see how we can improve on this plot. The first idea is just a um, styling issue or a, a suggestion I have that um, you may not find spectacular, but I find a little bit helpful and a little bit nicer, and that is to reduce the width of the bars, to set the bars apart a bit further. So we don't have to go with the default. So I just add the width parameter here to reduce the width of the bars. And we can move back and forth between the plots to see the effect. Another question that we may want to ask ourselves is how well we can read the percentages from the chart. And it turns out the exact percentages are not very easy to read, even if we can um, do a good job in um, seeing changes over time. The major grid lines and the tick marks on the y-axis are in uh, five units apart, five percent here. We will improve on the labeling in a moment but it means that the minor grid lines are 2.5 units or percentages apart. And I know the data, it's only integer numbers, so a grid line for 2.5% is not very convenient for reading the chart. So we may be tempted to label the bars. Of course, we can do that. And you see the code here on the left, how to do that using the geomtext function. And I use the Y coordinate to place the numbers one unit above the bars. We could also put them inside the bars if we preferred that. Um, and I use the paste function to add the percentage symbol, but I don't think this is a very good solution. It's a lot of numbers and if I need to display all the numbers, then I think the chart is doing a bad job um, in readability. So um, a better solution, I think, is to use um, less num fewer numbers or fewer information in the chart um, and display it a little bit better. So we can work on the y-axis to improve on that. So here I changed the breaks on the y-axis from steps of five units to steps of four units using the breaks parameter and scale y continuous, as you see in the code on the left. And now the major grid lines, the major horizontal grid lines are four units apart, which means the minor grid lines are two units or two percentages apart. So now I think we can read the percentages exactly. Let's see, starting out on the left in the panel for July, in the middle, candidate number three, it's easy to read exactly 20%. We move to the left to candidate number two, and we see it's exactly in the middle between 16 and 20%, so it has to be 18%, and moving to the left again to candidate one, uh, we can see it's exactly in the middle between 16 and 18 percent, so it's obviously 17 percent. So now we can read all the percentages exactly. Um, so I think readability is, is improved. We can have a look at the left again um, at the code. So I'm using the label percent function here from the scales package um, to turn y-axis labels to percent. I'm using the scale parameter because by default numbers would be multiplied by 100, assuming that we have numbers between 0 and 1, but here, um, looking to the previous plot, we already had numbers in the correct range between 0 and 100, so we don't want to multiply them by 100, so that's why I specified scale equals 1, and the parameter accuracy equals 1, and um, if I hadn't specified that, then we would see one decimal place, which we don't need here. Okay. I think readability is still a bit hard as we move to the panels on the right. For example, in September, um, we are quite far away from the y-axis labels, um, and now percentages are maybe not easy enough to read. So what else can we do to improve on readability? And my suggestion, suggestion would be to move the grid lines to the front. And this is how we can do that. I hope you find this a useful improvement. Um, the key parameter here is inside the theme function specifying the panel on top parameter and setting it to true. If I just did this one change and nothing else, then the whole background would move to the front, which means um, the panel background would overlay the bars and I wouldn't see any bars at all. So I also have to specify the panel background parameter and um, hide or disable the background using the fill equals NA parameter in the element rect function. So that way the background doesn't overlay the charts and only the grid lines come to the front. And another change that you might notice as I move back and forth between the last two plots is 
that I disabled the vertical grid lines. I don't think they're necessary here and I think it's a good idea to reduce the information displayed in the chart um, and so to help the reader just focus on what is necessary and I don't think the vertical grid lines are necessary here um, because the candidates are easy enough to make out uh, the bars um, use color information and there's no danger of uh, confusing the candidates I think. So we use the panel grid major X um, parameter and set it to element blank. Right, and now I think we can also read the exact percentages in the panel on the right. For example, September um, candidate number five, the bar on the right of the plot um, is exactly between 16 and 18 percent, so it has to be 17 percent, just like candidate one in July on the left of the plot. So now I think we have improved readability quite a bit. Can we do something about the facet labels? This is more of a visual improvement and not so much about readability. Um, but I wanted to show you that as well. Uh, moving back and forth between these two plots, you see that the facet labels that hold um, the strips that hold the months in which the polls were carried out, July, August and September, were changed a little bit. So I increased contrast, used a darker gray and changed font color to white to white and set um, font face to bold. So it's all parameters in the theme function, strip text and strip background correspond to these facet labels. Right, so now we have displayed our data and improved readability and worked on some visual aspects. Um, but what we haven't really done is told a story. So usually when we present data, um, it's a good idea to tell a story alongside the data. And now let's assume we're not interested in all the five candidates in the same way, but let's say that we are on the team for candidate three and we think that our main competitor is candidate number four. So this is what we want to focus on. Um, of course, we could show this plot and talk about these two candidates, but it's a good idea to help the readers focus on the comparison that we find important. So we can do that here. Um, I think this is an element of storytelling, helping the reader focus on these aspects that we want to focus on as well and we can help them visually so a common technique is to gray out the information that you want to um, still show but um, that you don't want the reader to focus on and use color to focus on those aspects that you find more important so here we're using gray for candidates one two and five and dark green for our candidate number three and salmon for candidate number four and now the comparison is easier to make and it's easier to focus on these candidates across the panels. So here we're using the fill parameter inside the GMCOIL function and we have to repeat it um, three times for the three facets that we're showing. Right, so now I think we have prepared the plots in such a way that we can tell a story about it. Um, that's basically what I wanted to show you about the static plots and as a bonus I want to show you an animation and let's just assume um, there are two more months of polls that we now can present. Of course we could use the same plot and um, present five facets ne next to each other but another nice way of um, showing changes over time in a plot is to use an animation and that's what we do here. Um, we have two more months now and we see that in October Candidates three and four lead together and in November um, our candidate number three wins. So there's a good end ending to our story. Our candidate finally reaches the top in the last month here in November. Um, focusing on the code on the left side, um, we see that it's very easy and takes very little additional code to change the static plot into an animation. We're using the ggAnimate package by Thomas Lynn Pedersen. He did so much brilliant work on ggplot2 extensions that he was offered a job by our studio that he couldn't decline. Um, so we're just using the transition states function, which is a very powerful function because it does not only create an animation from five points in time, but it also gives us some interpolation so that we don't have just five static plots displayed after each other but we also have a, a smooth transition between the states. This is powered by the tweener package in the background, but we don't have to worry about it. We just use the transition states function. The only other change we made in the code is 
um, the subtitle and we can use an internal variable that is um, provided by the ggAnimate package and the transition states function um, that helps us display the state or in this case the poll that the animation is currently showing. So the internal variable is called closest state and we have this um, curly braces notation that was made popular by the glue package um, so that we don't have to use the paste function and open and close quotation marks but we can use this notation inside the quotation marks and um, this text is replaced by the value of the variable. Right, that was it. I hope you found that useful. All the best for your own visualizations. Um, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. That really helps. All the best. See you next time. Ciao.